still instructs me, okay? I've been, <laughs> so I've been sent back. <laughs> so I've turned on that the presentation which I have uh, prepared, uh, including the two families, it will explain a little bit about the journey of Rai Bahadur Sundadas Chopra and Balbir Singh Upal. And uh, it's a very, very illustrious legacy. Uh, I hope I've been able to do justice through my book. And uh, let's watch it. So, Madhur, please. Sure. Sundar Mahal, 1918 ਸੰਦਾਨ <laughs> Thank 
Thank you, Mom, for sharing those clips. Um, hearing my grandfather speak about his journey certainly opens a whole slew of emotions for me. Um, to further our discussions on this mystifying topic of reincarnation, we are extremely grateful today to have among us three eminent guests as speakers uh, for the panel discussion this morning. Uh, Dr. Satwant K. Pasrija, 
uh, is a former head and pro professor of clinical psychology at Nimhans in Bangalore. She is, in fact, the only scholar in India trained in clinical psychology and clinical parapsychology, um, which she got at the University of Virginia. Um, she's also internationally renowned, uh, an internationally renowned authority um, on reincarnation research. Um, I actually happened to learn from my mother that Dr. Pastricha's uh, association with my grandfather goes back to 1999. He, uh, wrote, he actually wrote to uh, Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia back then and um, about his experience and Dr. Pastricha was a co-researcher working on a PhD at the time. Uh, we are honored to have her here and uh, share her unparalleled knowledge on reincarnation, a subject which, of course, uh, many, I'm sure, even today in this August gathering um, may be viewing with some level of skepticism and would like to have some answers. Uh, Dr. Pastricha, if you would like to join us on stage. Our second guest on the panel is Nitya Shanti, an internationally respected spiritual teacher, a seminar leader, a writer, an educator who blends a deep study of ancient scriptures along with a broad survey of contemporary discoveries uh, and specializes in facilitating profound shifts in awareness uh, for people to release limitations and awaken latent potentials for a fulfilling life. Uh, thank you, Nitya. We are humbled. Uh, that you could join us today. If you could also please join us on stage. Our third guest speaker on the panel is Dr. P.L. Dhar. Uh, Dr. Dhar is an ex-professor of mechanical engineering at IIT Delhi and who also conducts uh, spiritual meditation workshops in Delhi. Um, we, my mother and I and everyone else here, we're truly blessed by the fact that such stalwarts <laughs> accepted to bless my mother's earnest and humble attempt um, here today. Uh, Dr. Dharma, please also join us. And finally, our moderator um, to lead the discussion this morning is Shloka Nath. Uh, Shloka is currently the Senior Program Manager of Sustainability at the Tata Trusts. In this role, Shloka leads, uh, helps lead the organization's climate, energy, and environment work, implementing and funding sustainable and scalable solutions that help both people and nature thrive through India. Uh, prior to this, she co-founded and was the managing partner at Sankhya Women Impact Funds. Um, Shloka is also an angel, an angel investor in social enterprises and has mentored organizations across sectors. Uh, she was the managing editor for the Harvard Kennedy School Review and has spent over a decade in journalism at, uh, with the BBC in London with New Delhi Television and Forbes. Uh, Shloka has a Master in Public Policy from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government and a BSc in Government from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, and also, she just happens to be the great-granddaughter of Rai Bahadur Lala Sundar Das mm -hmm. Chopra. So, Shloka, uh, please also join us. I should certainly not be the one standing here at all talking and taking up too much of time. Uh, we're blessed with these eminent speakers and to converse on the subject. So could please help us uh, lead through this discussion. Thank you, Varun. Of course. Thank you, Varun. Of course. Thank you, Varun. That was um, so kind of you to introduce us. I just realized we sort of almost have the same grandparents. Almost. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to thank everyone for being here today. Um, it's going to be a very special discussion, um, not just because of all of you, but of course because of our illustrious panel of speakers who've got, you know, been so kind to come here today. Um, years ago, I watched a documentary on how doctors deal with terminally ill patients. And at one point, the conversation turned to how patients so often desperately cling to life. And it's a tendency that I think is very aptly expressed by a lot of people who do this research. 
um, specifically Damien Brinkley. He was a well-known author of best-selling books on the after-death experience. And he called it a greed for life. He said that the fear when this earthly life is over, we'll be annihilated, extinguished forever. And of course, the message becomes infinitely more palatable if we can say with conviction, I've lived before and I will live again. I've simply got to accept it and learn to deal with it wisely. And in this room, I suspect that most of us are fully open to that possibility. I remember someone once said to Swami Yogananda, you may choose to incarnate, but I prefer not to. And Swamiji was greatly amused by the comment, because it's fine if you can manage it, but the scriptures tell us that reincarnation is an inescapable reality. So the real issue isn't whether it's true, but how do we use it to lead better and more fulfilling lives while we are here. On that note, I would like to start off by asking Dr. Pasricha um, to start with her opening remarks. And just before we continue, just to let you know the format of this discussion, each of our panelists will give their opening remarks after which we will have a moderated discussion, and then we'll throw it open to the floor for your questions, because I'm sure you're all burning with a lot of questions. Dr. Pasricha. Thank you very much. And I thank all the uh, organizers and the audience who have gathered here, and I hope that uh, I'll be able to do justice to uh, the subject that has been chosen for today. Uh, I would be uh, giving you an overview of the re reincarnation research that I have been associated with for almost 40, more than 40 years. I joined Dr. Stevenson in 73 uh, as a trainee and subsequently I am working on this till date. Okay, I will give a little presentation here Next slide, please. <coughs> yeah, what I plan to do is, uh, first I'll give a brief introduction, then methods of investigation, a couple of illustrative case reports, and then what are the main features of these cases, and then how do we analyze and summarize the uh, presentation. Now, very briefly, I'd like to acknowledge the funding, people for funding, which was, and the uh, institutions. NIMHAS funded my research, ICMR, then uh, one private donor, University of Virginia. And I'd also like to thank for participation, all the subjects, those children and their families who have really borne with me for all these uh, long interviews uh, and various uh, field assistance. Next, please. Now, introduction and evolution of research. I think you will be very surprised to learn that the first uh, case was investigated like we do in present day was by none other than Aurangzeb, who himself was a Muslim, but came to know of a child in, during his period that he remembered a previous life who also, who died of an accident and in fact he died of a murder. Somebody murdered him and uh, when this child was born he had marks at the back of his uh, neck and also at the back where he was stabbed. So uh, uh, Aurangzeb called both the parties in his, uh, uh, this thing, uh, in front of him and he counter checked the facts and he was convinced about the case. Now, after that, uh, the recent research or the actual research started somewhere in 1920s uh, by K.K. Sahai, who was in Bareilly, and uh, he studied a few cases, and uh, till about 1960, only 26 cases were uh, studied. Subsequently, in 1960, Dr. Ian Stevenson, he started his work in the University of Virginia, he came to uh, India, then he came to, uh, went to Sri Lanka and several other countries. And now we have with him about 2,600 cases on record that, we have, that he has studied 
and uh, I had access to all of these. But in India, I have studied nearly 500 cases, and rest of them, of course, are shown on the slide. Next slide, please. Now, introduction to a case. Typical case, a child starts making statements when the child is about uh, two and a half to three years old, and then continues to talk about it till the age of five. So two to five years is the age when they speak. Sometimes even before uh, acquiring speech, they can uh, they start telling in uh, gestures about their previous lives, and then either on their insistence or on the child's uh, insistence, or the previous family happens to learn about this child's statements. The two families concerned meet, and these child children, in addition to making statements, they also show some unusual behavior which matches the statements uh, and the life and behavior of the person whose life they claim to remember. I usually call them previous personality. And subsequently, the two families concerned meet in most of the cases, and their uh, visits continue depending on their uh, conviction or status and other things. We do then follow up of these cases. The imaged memories fade away between the five and eight years. Behavior persists a little longer. Next slide, please. Now, I'll just give you very briefly, I've chosen this pre-1935 cases. That's where Mr. Opal's case of, uh, uh, finds its place. And uh, first is the famous case of Shanti Devi which was uh, we developed in 1935, and there was a committee who went into the uh, statements of hers. She was three and a half years when she remembered the life in Mathura. She went on giving in a uh, talking in a local dialect also that she was married, and her parents did not pay much heed to it. Then she was put to school, and then when she was in school, she continued to talk about this and that she was married in her uh, classmates started teasing her that she's a married uh, woman. Eventually, a teacher took word to the previous family or some, or they wrote to the uh, previous family, the address which she had given, and eventually the two families concerned met, and the case was verified. Next slide, please. Now, the second case is that of Jagdish Chandra. He was, again, no, please. Uh, next slide. Pre previous, this thing. Uh, Jagdish Chandra was the son of KK and Sahai, who was interested in uh, reincarnation cases because his own son remembered a previous life, and he was a lawyer in Bareilly. So he went very systematically, noted down all the statements of this child, and before uh, he could take him to the previous life, uh, previous family, and this child gave statements about the life in Mathura. And he was a young child when he died. And uh, first, the previous families, first the previous family's uh, father refused to acknowledge the case, but eventually they found it, and the two families concerned met uh, uh, in uh, 1926. And uh, the best part of this case was that there was a written record made uh, before the two families concerned met. So this was very uh, uh, the sound case, in my opinion, because uh, authenticity-wise, this was a very authentic case. Now, the next case is comes, uh, the photograph that we received was in 1999, and uh, who's the hero of today's uh, uh, day, and uh, uh, you will learn much more about him from uh, uh, you've already seen a film about him uh, prepared by his own daughter, uh, Miss Amrita uh, Upal. Next slide. Now, I'll very briefly tell you the features of these cases that we have found. Uh, first, next slide. First, they make statements about a previous life, and uh, which is about between the ages of two and five. Then they make statements Apart from statements, they also display uh, behavioral features, like in their play activities, or they mimic the occupation of the previous person. 
and when they meet the previous family or otherwise when they are uh, recalling their previous lives, they also show emotions and then also phobias uh, related to the persons. Supposing somebody was murdered, for example, they, were, uh, they will have phobia of that person, places and uh, weapons that were associated with the termination of that life. And some of these cases we have uh, recently started studying, they have facial uh, resemblance or gait or posture uh, corresponding to the previous personality and also birthmarks and birth defects related to the uh, wounds of the previous family, of uh, previous personality. Now, unusual behavior features I've already completed. Next, next slide, please. Because this also included a larger number of uh, uh, behavioral features, such as cross-dressing, if it's a sex change case, and uh, difficulty in adjusting to the anatomical sex. Uh, methods of investigation, very briefly. Next slide. We go in a group of people uh, to interview the uh, first, the subject's family, the child who claims to remember his previous life, and we go in a team of more than two persons so that one person is not always biased or doesn't write down what he has, um, he wants to write or what he wants to listen. And we always go in a group of people for authenticity and safety also. Uh, we interview multiple first-hand uh, new and neutral informants. First-hand because they would have on both the sides subject side and previous personality side so that there's no bias and multiple personal multiple informants because uh, uh, one person may make a, a mistake or may misremember things or add up something so we overall then at the end of the day we used to compare our notes we rarely used uh, tape recordings because it becomes a little difficult for us to later identify who said what and also people used to become those days very uh, self-conscious and they would not give us uh, information that we needed so we used to take down handwritten notes and then of course we go to the hospitals we go to the police stations to uh, get the documents pertaining to the dates of birth of the children uh, who remember previous lives and date of death or mode of death and also to check the post-mortem records uh, wherever to match the uh, birthmarks on the uh, body of the subject which match with the previous personalities, wounds or uh, wounds. And then of course we conduct follow-up interviews to see the development of these children. Next slide please. Analysis of data very briefly. We analyze the cases, case reports uh, in groups to check the recurrent features and then individual cases for alternate uh, interpretations. In group of uh, recurrent features, we have found that children start talking between the ages of two to four in all the cultures, across cultures we have these features. And then they stop talking about previously, spontaneously stop talking about previous life between the ages of five and eight. And uh, there's a more mention of uh, violent mode of death. And also, there is actually a much higher uh, frequency of violent mode of death than in the general population in those uh, cases. Then we weigh the, each case for uh, contesting hypothesis. I've just mentioned here a few Freud, uh, uh, normal interpretations we consider fraud fantasy, retrospective falsification, genetic memory, etc. And paranormal interpretations, we see ESP, that is the child is uh, getting this information through extrasensory perceptions and personating it on himself. And then by process of elimination, we come to the reincarnation. Next slide. Yeah, I've already spoken about recurrent features across, uh, across cultures. Next slide, we can go. Next. Now, possible implications of this reincarnation in understanding. One, 
of infancy and early childhood, absence of known causes or explanations, we understand phobias of childhood, unusual animosities and attachments, unusual parent relationship, to name a few, and medical anomalies. Next slide, please. And differences in monozygotic twins, of course. Now, to sum up, next. Uh, less than 30 cases were reported before 1960s, and since 1960, nearly 2,600 2600 cases have been reported from different cultures, including the Western cultures. Analysis reveals right, uh, certain recurrent features across cultures, and among com contesting interpretations, each one has a weakness, and reincarnation seems to be the best to account for all the features considered together. Next slide. Hmm. And before I end, I would like to end with a disclaimer that this interpretation of reincarnation for previous life memories is presented as a supplement to the existing knowledge of genetics and environmental influences uh, in anomalous cases, conditions in health and behavior, and it's not a challenge to or replacement for the existing knowledge. Next slide. Yeah, I end with a quotation, working for oneself, working for success will make you a master, but working for satisfaction, as Madam has done, will make you a legend. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prasitra. Um, Nitya, could I request you for your opening remarks? All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pastrija. You really covered a lot in a very short time. Thank you. So I am uh, very grateful to be here. And sitting on the stage is Dr. Dhar, who was one of the people who introduced me to meditation. So it's really a privilege. He is the father of a classmate of mine. And when I first got interested in meditation, I would go to him. He's, uh, he'd share his own journey, but he uh, was an IIT professor and also a senior meditation teacher. And I remember an interaction with him early in the day, and I asked him, uh, back then, and I asked him, why do we meditate? He said, we meditate to be happy. I said, I'm already happy. <laughs> he said, you think you're happy. <laughs> and I didn't like his answer. But when I went to do a meditation course, I realized it's true. We have a superficial veneer of happiness, but deep down, there's so much of discontentment, so much of reaction going on. So I'm very grateful to you, Dr. Dhar, for being one of the early people in my journey that inspired me. Um, interesting topic on uh, past life, future life, reincarnation. Honestly, I've never been that drawn or interested in this topic. I've really been more interested in this life. <laughs> I saw a cartoon where there were these three stalls. One is telling you about past life, one is telling you about your future, and one is telling you about this life. And the longest lines are on past life and future life. There's no one interested in the present. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wants to know what happened in the past, what will happen in the future. No one's that interested in the present. But I somehow always be more interested in the present. So with that, just that groundwork, I'll share some of my perceptions on, uh, on what I've understood about these matters. Interestingly, my mother is here, and my mother actually did remember her past life. And maybe you can share more, uh, I don't know if I get it right, but what I remember is that when she was young, she remembered, uh, was it Allahabad, mom? That you were in Allahabad? Oh, you forgot one. <laughs> okay, now you conveniently forgot. <laughs> but uh, she remembered that she was born in Allahabad, and they went and checked, and they verified, and actually turned out to be true. But they were afraid that she might get confused, so they didn't let her talk about it much. So as a result, she doesn't remember so many details anymore. So uh, there's a nice story of a Zen master who was asked, um, what happens after death? So Zen master said, I don't know. He said, you're a Zen master. He said, yes, but not a dead one. <laughs> and that's my approach. You know, I, I like to go with my personal experience. So while there's a lot of research and a lot of people's experiences, what is my real experience? Whether I believe in past life or future life, I have to believe in this life. I right? have to believe in this. And that's where I make my stance. That's why I take it. I apply it to this moment. And in this moment, there is constant arising and passing. As you're sitting here, breath is arising and passing. You see, you see somewhere else, 
eye sensed door, ear sensed door, nose, smell, taste, touch. All sensed doors are continuously based on arriving and passing. That's the kind of birth, that's the kind of death. And you notice one birth affects the other birth, right? Someone sitting next to you is talking on their phone during the gathering and you're getting irritated. What's wrong with this person? Can't they behave themselves? We are in a gathering over here, right? And that irritation lingers. Now they've stopped talking, but the irritation lingers. That birth led to the next birth. So in some sense, every state of mind, every state of being is lingering. It's continuing. And we know all across nature, like for example, the kind of seed you plant is the kind of tree you get. So I don't think it's too much to think that, you know, necessarily that, oh, when we die, suddenly everything comes to a zero. Not necessarily. If they're unresolved things, then the momentum continues. The momentum continues until... So in life, there are two things. There's change and there's non-change. Right? So right now, we are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. And then there is something that is aware of that. So when you look in the mirror, when we are 10 years old, we looked in the mirror, we looked a certain way. Now when you look in the mirror, chances are we could look quite different, unless you are 10 years old, you still look quite different now. But the sense that I'm looking, that's still there, that hasn't changed. That sense of I'm looking at me, that hasn't changed. So what I realized is, right here in this moment there is change, and right here in this moment is also non-change. It's right here. So this journey continues until the sense of mirror versus reflection. Mirror is the same, reflection keeps changing. But actually there is no mirror without reflection and the reflection requires a mirror. So this is an art 